कॉपी Hey Kanat, can you see my, see the screen? I can see the screen. I can see oh, your screen. I'm just mailing you. to Lucy the link. Yes. Amanda, will it be possible for you to mail the link to all the panelists? They all have their individual links, but I can resend them. Yes. Okay. Thanks. So Kanat, let them know that we are sending the link. Um, it looks like one of them was joined as a participant, so I'll promote him now. Okay. Okay, I'll let all of them know that. I don't see Luis or Savario yet. Do you see Luisy? No. no. Lucy, just email to all of us saying that on the line are we starting. I can see Yanis joining the link. Hey, Yanis. Hi, everyone. Sorry about that. Yeah, that's a confusion. Even two of our panelists haven't joined yet, so. So I just got an email from Luis Sangupta. She says she's online and she's waiting for us to start. I don't know if she also got the link. I so sent just a separate email. Just, yeah, I was gonna say, just as an FYI, I have three invites currently on my calendar for this meeting. So chances are <laughs> they're all in that same same boat where they went to one of the other three links uh, before they got here. So. So in my case, I was stuck in the waiting room for seven, eight minutes. Um, I, it was asking for a uh, password. Um, so I, I had that uh, signed into my own account at my university to be able to access this as. Um, the video is here, I can see. Amanda Lucy is saying that she's waiting for us to let her in. Can you see her waiting? I'm not sure. She says my waiting to her, let her in because we don't have a waiting room for webinars. And she's not in the attendee list. Okay, so, I think you sent her another Zoom link. I did. Uh, you did? Okay. Hey, uh, Kanat, can you let her know that we have sent another Zoom link? Just ask okay. her to click that. It's an email directly from Zoom. So be aware that from you? DOD computers were having problems and other security things were uh, banging up against your Zoom link. So I actually had to switch to a different computer. I see. So Amanda, you sent the link, right? Yes, I just resent it. Okay, I mailed her saying that Amanda sent you a direct link. Please join that. Okay, I think we can get started, and and, and hopefully she would be able to join uh, in a minute or so. So uh, let's let's get started. It's I think three minutes past uh, the hour, five minutes past the hour. So we should start because we we have. Uh, uh, a really exciting discussion to follow. So welcome everybody. This is the sixth, uh, this is the seventh virtual panel organized by the CAT for Assurance Initiative. And this is a slide which I prepared on behalf of the, the organizing committee for CAT for Assurance to just let you know what is the initiative and, and a little bit of background about that, what we are trying to do. This was established in 2020, October, during the peak of pandemic by members of the hardware security community. When I say member, uh, a large number of members came forward and established that forum so that uh, academic research community can share their tools and benchmarks as well as research results through that forum on hardware and system security. So the, the goal was to rapidly disseminate the, the research results and benchmarks and tools to, to other people who can benefit from those. So far, we have 56 different tools and that's, that's quite a lot. And then that number is of course growing and over 3000 different benchmarks in that website, you will be 
able to access them right now. We have more than 80 contributors, um, more than 12,000 users. You can see at the bottom, this is a snapshot I took yesterday. Uh, we have about 13,350 uh, users and, and, and more than 40,000 page views. That's definitely a really, really encouraging number given the size of the hardware security community. So really appreciate all the support which um, has been provided by the community, um, but we also would solicit your contributions. If you have not done that yet, feel free to load, upload your tools, feel free to participate in the webinars, which are focused on tool demos. Also participate in the virtual panels, which you are doing regularly. There has been six virtual panels between 2021 and 2022, more than 1500 total registrations and more than 1200 attendees. We are fortunate to have sponsorship from, from IEEE CEDA, IEEE Hardware Security Technical Committee, and then several mainstream industry who came forward and technically sponsored that. So with that, I will acknowledge the sponsorship one more time. And then I will show you that uh, basically the, the users for CAT4 Assurance are coming from all across the world. Right now we have 124 different countries uh, which are represented here. You can see the map who are using the tools or benchmarks in the website. And we invite you to help with this initiative definitely in any way you can, please do help us. And with that, I'll come to the seventh panel, which is on microelectronic supply chain security. I believe that's a very important topic, particularly at this time. And um, I'm really glad that we have been able to assemble a, a, a distinctive set of experts to talk about this important issue. And we have uh, two of the really rising stars in this area, Dr. Konrad Basu and Dr. Yonis Savides from UT Dallas and Drexel University, respectively, they agreed to moderate this session. So of course, uh, I think most of you know them very, very well. I'll not spend much time in introducing them. They can talk a little bit about themselves. But I'm really pleased to have such great moderators and such distinctive set of panelists to talk about an important issue in hardware security. With that, I'll hand over to the moderators. Um, stay engaged. Uh, we want your interaction during the panel. Konad and Ionis, please take over. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Swaroop. So um, let me also uh, take a moment to welcome you to this edition of uh, CAD for Assurance uh, panel on microelectronics supply chain security. So I am uh, Ioannis Savidis, uh, an associate professor from Drexel University, uh, and with my friend and colleague, uh, Kanad Basri from UT Dallas, will be moderating, moderating today's panel. Um, we know that with uh, the globalization of microelectronics manufacturing, the security of the IC supply chain has manifested itself as a major consideration of uh, modern hardware systems. So large SOCs, they often integrate third-party intellectual property or, or 3P IPs, which may be procured from untrusted entities uh, that could potentially compromise the security of the entire system. Uh, to address these concerns, uh, researchers in academia, government, and industry have proposed several countermeasures at various levels from RTL to layout to devices, including um, logic obfuscation, IC camouflaging, uh, and IC watermarking. Uh, this panel will, uh, will discuss these challenges and potential solutions and forecast new uh, frontiers to explore uh, by the, uh, the hardware security community. And, and with that, let me uh, introduce our excellent group of panelists for you today. Uh, we have Matthew Areno from uh, Intel, Saverio Fazari from Booz Allen Hamilton, uh, Vipul J. Patel from Air Force Research Labs, um, Ulrich Rumar from LMU, and Louise Sangupta from Northrop Grumman. Um, each panelist uh, will be introduced by either uh, myself or Kanad, and we'll have five to six minutes to provide a positional statement. Um, after the panelists' uh, positional statements, we will have a Q&A for the remainder of our time together. And to kick off, our, our first panelist is um, Dr. Luis Sangupta. Um, Dr. Luis Sangupta is currently the Director of, of Business Growth for Advanced Processing, where she leads the business capture for the Advanced Processing Business Unit within the Network Information Solutions Division of Northrop Grumman. She is responsible for growing the business and creating the go-to market strategy for edge processing and AI and autonomy across all services and, and internal to the company. She joined Northrop in 2015 and expanded the work in digital AESAs, trusted electronics, advanced imaging, and advanced processors. Prior to this, she was the Director of Advanced Sensors for BAE Systems, Columbia, Maryland, 
and served as uh, an engineering fellow for BAE Systems and was the first woman to be elected to this position. From 98 to 2006, Dr. Sengupta founded and served as CEO, uh, CTO of uh, Paratech Microwave that was acquired by BlackBerry RF in 2011. Uh, she, uh, sorry. she graduated with a PhD in electrical engineering from the University of South Florida in uh, 1990 and has over 50 publications and over 70 issued patents. And with that, um, I will let Dr. Sengupta share her screen. Oh, uh, you are muted, Louise. All right, am I unmuted now? You are audible now, thanks. All right, fantastic, thank you. All right, so let me go ahead and get my presentation ready. And hopefully you can see my screen. Yes, we can see your screen. All right, let me just make it a little bigger. And is that better? Yes. Okay, so um, I was, while we were, you were talking, I'm debating whether I would show my slides, but um, I thought I would give the perspective of the defense industry here a little bit, and um, by giving sort of a background and the interest that we have and the challenges thereof. Um, so for those who, who are not uh, in the know, but I think everybody on this phone call probably is, that, um, you know, microelectronics has become the number one DOD top technology uh, priority, uh, shifting from uh, hypersonics. And that happened back in the 2020 timeframe. A number of us were on some of the Defense Science Board committees where this started happening. Um, and the idea was for the DOD to move from a trusted foundry to a zero trust. And so, you know, this obviously poses a lot of supply chain security issues, um, but nevertheless is the way that we need to be going forward. Um, so there was some major um, studies that were conducted by the Defense Science Board, uh, of which I was also part of back in 2021. And then, of course, we all know that President Biden signed a very large bill uh, for the Chips and Science Act uh, for um, domestication of a variety of, of manufacturing, as well as workforce, as well as all the programs that we all know about um, in the semiconductor industry. Um, I think, I think again, just a picture of this, and again, you've seen a lot of this in, in the meetings that we all attend, but the idea is what can we do to actually onshore advanced node access and, and, and also shore up our fragile supply chain. Um, we all know the challenge is there and, and it's big and uh, the investments being made in, in Southeast Asia um, that we're up against here and the mature technology and the foundries and packaging facilities there. Um, but nevertheless, that's, that is our challenge. Um, we need a long-term initiative. The OSD folks have put out a number of programs a number of us are part of um, that started uh, back in the 2021 and before timeframe. And these are partnerships uh, with a variety of other age, uh, government agencies. And again, the idea is to really shore up the infrastructure around microelectronics and also the security piece of it. So a number of these things have been in play um, for both uh, design tools, as well as third party IP that was mentioned, as well as the actual manufacturing environments, packaging as well. Um, so just to give perspective of the things that the defense really cares about. So we do really care about domestic uh, capability, right? So this is really needed. I think one thing that a lot of folks don't realize, though, is that we also need access to advanced node CMOS. I think a lot of folks have the idea that that's really the cell phone in the commercial industry driving that, which it is. Uh, but also this access is very important in order to, to maintain and project national security. And the reason is because we really want to go, obviously, to a digital uh, warfighting regime, and that's going to actually require us to have digital circuits that are really low swap C, and uh, that's really driving us there. We need augmented CMOS, so beyond CMOS, I know there's been a lot of talk about that and why that's important, again, for the DOD. Um, as well as 3D packaging, um, we also need access to 3.5 semiconductors. And again, that's really to create our, our front ends and some of our other technologies in the EOIR domain. 
Um, in order to achieve um, the, the first three, we need access to EDA tools. And this is becoming more and more complicated as we go to more advanced known CMOS or 3D integration and or any type of heterogeneous semiconductor approach as well. And, um, and then I think, again, maturing, maturing these things is also very important. Uh, the type of things we do with these is kind of illustrated here. So uh, direct RF sampling. So this is really one of the things we want to have all digital ESA technology. What does that create for us? Well, that creates the ability to do multifunction RF. Um, and, and, and really, we know that our, our adversaries already have access to this. So this is propelling us for that access that I mentioned to advanced node CMOS as well. We need the front end devices, which is the 3.5 mostly uh, as well. We need to be able to design for trust. So we're gonna talk about that. I know a lot of my panel members are gonna talk about that as well. Um, there was programs that DARPA, DARPA has had over the years too, and we participated in as well. Uh, to get that moving. Um, there's a lot of programs that were really geared towards securing the supply chain. Uh, Northrop has a, a very large production part, which I support in securing electronics, right? And, and we're actually in a lot of the systems that are fielded today um, to do so. Um, we also need to be able to broaden that from the RF to the EOIR domain. And we need to be able to create advanced processing behind our digital sensors. Again, all of those add security um, issues across the supply chain. And you can see it's pretty vast, pretty heterogeneous. And we need to be able to do that with affordability. Um, so we get to my last slide here, which is the key consideration. So as I've, as I've pointed out for the de defense department, we have to have a highly diversified ecosystem and you can see why, because we're really after a heterogeneous approach here. We need multi-decade multi, multi, multi -decade access. Unlike the commercial industry, our products are out there for decades, right? We don't go and change things on, um, on some of our very advanced aircraft or things like that um, every year, like we do in cell phones. So, so this is something. So we need advancement, but we also need sustainment. Um, we need to obviously have that across the whole of government and industry. Um, and we require security and tailorability in that security. So a lot of our uh, very critical uh, parts, our electronic parts need, need um, extreme security. And we have to have that to be able to withstand nation, nation um, state attacks. Um, but we also want to be able to tailor that so that we can also you know, lessen the security where we want to um, have higher volume and or more commercial implementation. Uh, so what we do for that is we need to have a root of security and it needs to be, uh, is, is really needed for most of our critical applications, but we also need to be able to have access so that we can create a low power effective root of security. And, and with the idea in mind that many of our systems need to be able to be deployed in ITAR and also be able to withstand uh, nation state attacks. Um, and as I said before, in order to create this, we need that access and we need to have the technologies available and the IP available to create that root of security, as well as um, additional packaging around that. And, and also we are looking at a, at a variety of new techniques that are out there in the redaction approaches that can also help us. And that was that. Thank you, Lucy. Thank you. So, so we will move on to our next uh, panelist, who is uh, Dr. Vipul Patel. Uh, he received both his BS degree in electrical engineering and an MS degree in computer engineering from the University of Cincinnati, Ohio. He received his PhD in electrical engineering from the Wright State University in Dayton, Ohio. Dr. Patel is currently the Department of Air Force or DAF representative to the Office of the Under Secretary of Defense, OUSD's Defense Microelectronics Cross Functional Team, or DMCFT. He was an integrated circuit designer and fabrication process engineer with analog devices in Dallas, Texas, where he worked on production CMOS timing circuit chiplets and sub micron CMOS process development. Dr. Patel joined AFL in December 2003 as one of the founding members of Air Force Sleep Research Laboratory's Microelectronics Design Center, leading research and development, verification, and validation of next generation data converters, radio frequency front end operators, reconfigurable transmitters, and trust in assurance. In recent years, 
He is working the strategy for access, availability, and enable, enablement of microelectronics intellectual properties and technologies within the Department of Air Force and served as the co lead for OUFD's trusted and assured microelectronics programs, education, and workforce development. He holds four patents and has authored and co authored more than 30 conference and referred journal articles and one book chapter. So, Dr. Patel, if you're ready, you can share your screen and uh, we, you can discuss about your preliminary thoughts. Thank you, Dr. Basu. Um, unfortunately, I was not able to get all of my materials cleared in time. So, what I will do is I will talk to some major points, um, if that's all right with the, the rest of the committee and panel. Sure. Sure. Um, so I want to say hello to everyone, and uh, firstly, I would like to thank the IEEE Council on the um, Electronic Design Automation and today's hosts and moderators for the opportunity to speak. And since microelectronics is a community activity, I really do appreciate these types of forums and panels in which we really do get to bring in various organizations' perspectives and ideas. So uh, I also want to thank my esteemed co-panelists today. In fact, um, with what Dr. Sengupta has spoken about and Mr. Fazari is going to be speaking about later, you know, I work very closely with them in the DOD and we share much of the same issues and concerns that Dr. Sengupta has already presented. So thank you, Louise, for uh, making my talk a little shorter <laughs> and easier to work through. Um, but before I start, you know, I, I do have to say this, that the views that I'm expressing in this panel do not reflect the official guidance and position of the United States government or the Department of Defense and the Department of Air Force. So, you know, Dr. Sengupta set up the, the talk really well from the DOD perspective, but we all know that mobile is still leading um, the state of the art microelectronics markets with computing and data centers and servers following closely. And truthfully, automotive is also on the rise as they're reassessing their supply chain to be more hands-on um, and to be more of a critical player in their supply. But for the government and military electronics, the demand overall has been around 1%, if I'm being uh, very generous, it's typically less than 1%. Uh, to kind of provide some context in this, in, in 2017, if you looked at it, the DOD was about two and a half billion dollars in a market that was approximately 300 billion. So even with these numbers um, showing that the DOD is such a small um, purchaser and buyer of microelectronics, the DOD, need, DOD still needs access to the leading edge. We still need access to the state of practice and to mature nodes as we look at systems that are 30 uh, years old. Uh, the shortfalls in the su semiconductor supply chain is not coming from the design within the uh, DOD um, and our defense industrial base. We do have people that are very capable of doing the design, but from an onshore manufacturing perspective, we have seen a lot of commitment from the United States government uh, to invest in the semiconductor manufacturing. For the sake of today's discussion, um, let's, let's say that developing, prototyping, and production of microelectronics requires, you know, it's a condensed um, view of it, but design, foundry or manufacturing, packaging, printed circuit board, assembly and test. So across the spectrum, really can observe the various aspects of the value chain. We need specialized equipment, materials, intellectual properties was brought up. Uh, those are the ones that are generated by the respective companies or organizations, but also the ones that we are able to license um, from third party vendors. The software and hardware tools, and more importantly, the workforce and support, right? So a lot of these things that we talked about access is great, but if there isn't um, a workforce behind it that can supply that knowledge base or continue in the advancement of these technologies, we are at a loss. So with all of that said, typically for the DOD applications, it's a uh, high mix and low volume, which means that the DOD needs to manufacture unique and more complex products with quality and reliability requirements that go beyond what commercial has. And this does include everything from like photonics to focal plane arrays to RF terahertz range, uh, RF front ends, to analog and then to digital. 
So as we've seen in recent articles uh, that are publicly available, as the construction of these onshore semiconductor manufacturing is occurring, it's a very expensive endeavor. And unfortunately, a DOD is not in a position to build our own leading edge fabs. So taking this from another DOD unique situation within the supply chain is that our technical refreshes and sustainment of systems and platforms are in the tens of decades, as I mentioned earlier, even approaching a century, like with the B-52 platform. Um, so what I'm saying is this leads to another interesting area of the supply chain um, where we're looking at diminishing manufacturing sources and materials, which then requires us, uh, the DOD, to look at non-traditional methods for access and sustainability, even going as far as to the extreme side where we would have to redesign our systems. So with the redesign and systems and the modernization efforts that you are seeing or hearing about, uh, there are opportunities for the DOD to rethink the supply chain, to really leverage and implement the concepts of digital engineering. And an approach is to require, like for example, a full bill of materials of microelectronics that go into a platform. Another approach is for the DOD to be an active player in the microelectronics ecosystem and to develop relationships directly with our supply chain vendors. Um, you know, this, this, as Dr. Sangupta had mentioned, this falls into the whole of government and industry approach where we, the DOD is not just thinking of agencies, but our contractor partners. We're thinking of the academics. We're thinking about the uh, federally funded research centers. We're thinking about university research centers that are all contributing to our mission. Um, so, you know, another and probably a final thing is, is really having guaranteed access to the full technical stack and solution stack. The government, operates very differently than commercial does in that usually you see an R&D prototype approach and then production. The DOD itself as an agency does not do products, but we heavily rely on our industrial base and contractors um, to help us do that production piece. And so being able to share that information more fluidly um, and ensuring that we have access to that full tech stack uh, as we do these vertical integrated and assembly across the primes and contractors is very key. Um, this is a change in the conventional perspective wherein microelectronics are their the third party IPs are now being considered more like COTS. Um, so if we start early in the design cycle, if we start early in a program development cycle and we're working with vendors through the supply chain, this is not to own anything necessarily. It is very much just the ability to have access to it. This will help us in modernizing systems, right? So if I have access to the essential building blocks of complex systems, this will allow me, the DOD, to retarget, design a new system or increment quicker um, because we have that stack available. So in my opinion, the microelectronics IP and EDA ecosystem has been going, uh, has been doing digital engineering successfully since the 1980s. I mean, we have integrated circuits, multi-chip packages, 50 billion transistor quote unquote systems that are already being designed, stored, managed, um, archived, and in some cases resurrected, but definitely you see it in a reuse fashion. So even within the last two decades, it's become quite obvious that every stage in the development of microelectronics requires understanding of the next stage's requirements uh, to be considered in the, in the moment. So for example, while you're doing an integrated circuit design, you know, the designer must be aware of the packaging and PCB implications and bring that to the, uh, to the current development process. And to really extend that thought a bit, the DOD really sees an area of growth um, to develop digital engineering environments and microelectronic software tools that go from what we've dubbed as like atoms, but basically devices and materials to system levels. So if I want to insert this into a platform that I have the ability to map everything from that low level to the, uh, the higher level, and then to be able to run our mission scenarios with that. So it allows us to see if we're running a mission, how the microelectronics needs to be and operate. So 
Um, you know, what I what I want to say finally is that you know what do EDA and emulation digital access to microelectronics technology offer in terms of assurance, right? So faster time to market, we get the ability to see. So there's that transparency, uh, the trust but verify concept is there. The quality that we're able to put out uh, initially is much higher. Um, for us, as we're doing, as we're having these systems fielded and we're seeing issues with it, allows us to see the root cause um, and identify those issues and then analyze them. We can do improvements and really quickly turn those improvements over at lower costs. Um, and we can do that virtualization before manufacturing, right? So what does this all mean to the DOD? And, and this is kind of a tongue in cheek thing, but it's all about risk mitigation, which for me um, is always nice to see more green boxes in my risk matrix. Uh, but with that, I'll, I'll stop. Um, I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Patel. So our next uh, panelist is uh, Ulrich Rukmar. Uh, Dr. Rukmar is a full research professor and vice director the Secure Computation lab, uh, lab at the University of Connecticut, and the guest professor at LMU Munich. He holds a PhD in computer science from TU Berlin, a PhD in electrical engineering from TU Munich, and an MS in mathematics from Oxford. <clears throat> uh, Dr. Rukmar's research interests include applied cryptography, hardware security, physically unclonable functions, and complexity theory at large, where he has co-authored around 100 papers in the past. He serves as associate editor at the IEEE Transactions on Information Forensics and Security, Journal of Cryptographic Engineering, Journal of Hardware and System Security, and Eurosip Journal of Information Security. Dr. Rukmar is also the founder and steering committee chair of the ASHES Workshop at ACM CCS, a steering committee member of the International Conference on Security, Privacy, and Applied Cryptographic Engineering, and a co-speaker of the uh, research focus on physics and security at the Center for Advanced Studies at LMU Munich. And with that, uh, Dr. Rukmar, you can share your screen. Thanks, Yannis. Thanks for the kind introduction. Also, thanks to the organizers for inviting me. It's certainly both a pleasure and an honor to be here. Um, I chose a slightly provocative title for my introductory statement. It's Supply Chain Security Can Puffs uh, Save Us? And let me perhaps start by um, uh, by revisiting the problem statement, actually, and um, let me start by pointing out the multidimensionality uh, of the supply chain security problem. Um, I think we should concede at the beginning of this panel, or at least I would personally like to concede at the beginning of my introductory statement, that we cannot hope for a simple one-fits-all solution. I think there is no silver bullet. I think that's fair to say. Uh, and the reason is that there are simply too many players, too many problem levels, and too many fraud scenarios in this complex environment that modern supply chains have become. Um, what we can do instead is, of course, to look for partial solutions on various levels. There are these various levels, of course, technical level, political slash diplomatic level, legislative level, et cetera, et cetera. And my introductory statement will actually focus on the technical level. Um, I will pose the question, can POFs, can physical unclonable functions save us or to downtone things, to tone down things, can they uh, at least help us, can they assist us? in achieving our goals in supply chain security? And I think the answer is actually, yes, they can, uh, because POFs can help us in system authentication, which is a very important subpart of supply chain security. And let me just quickly tell you how that works. So let's assume that we have a microelectronic system, MS, then we can add a physical unclonable function, a POF, to that system. We can also look for inherent POFs inside the system. So as we know, uh, essentially any electronic component in the microelectronic system will be subject to manufacturing variations, will be subject to disorder, and will be unclonable. So it qualifies as a POF, basically. So we can either add POFs or use inherent system parts as POFs. And now let's assume that some party Alice along the supply chain <clears throat> wanted to verify or authenticate the system then there's a relatively famous and well-established protocol based on POFs where 
you assume that Alice opens an online channel to some trusted party. That trusted party maintains a database of POF CRPs, and then you would use that trusted database together with the online channel, together with the physical access that Alice has to the microelectronic system at the time of verification in order to authenticate the system. I think this is long known, and most people in the audience probably will know that protocol, or at least um, can look it up if they want to in the literature, because it's really omnipresent almost in the POF literature. What I'd like to point out, and what is perhaps the first thing that I would like to draw your attention to in this panel, is that there is also an offline version of that protocol. Um, so using a variant of POFs that is known as unique object or UNO for short, you can implement the same process or the same task in an offline setting. And that means that our trusted third party has you know, much less work to do. There's a great reduction of labor on the side of the trusted third party, because anything that the trusted third party needs to do is to create a digital signature of the unique properties of that you know or that unique object. And that digital signature only needs to be created once at production time. Uh, and then it's stored together with the microelectronic system. And once that has been accomplished, once that has been done, our you know party Alice, who wants to verify the authenticity of the system, uh, can run an arbitrary number of offline verifications without ever getting the trusted third party involved. So the trusted third party only needs to act once and then arbitrarily many offline verifications are possible later on. Um, I can't go further into the details, but I thought that's interesting. And especially I thought it's interesting to point out that possibility for offline verification. If any of you are interested, you might look at you know, any of the surveys and tutorials uh, that are out there on PUFFs. I think there are plenty of them. Uh, this is one of them, a relatively recent one from Jason from uh, 2022. Now, why are we doing this? What are the advantages? What are the potential advantages of this puff based approach to uh, secure authentication? Well, I think the first and foremost advantage, and some of you might find that interesting, hopefully, is that there are no permanent digital secret keys in the microelectronic systems. So we're really lifting or elevating security to the next level, in my opinion, because we circumvent the need for permanently stored digital secret keys in the system, which always represent a primary attack vector, as we know. Um, secondly, we gain a surprising level of security against malicious manufacturers because even the malicious manufacturers could not clone or could not duplicate the puffs. I think that's a second important advantage. And then this approach generally can be made to work even with non-electronic puffs or non-electronic unique objects, which is also an asset in certain situations. Now, towards the end of my statement, I wanted to present an outlook, uh, perhaps some impulse also for the discussion later on, or for anyone who's interested in doing future research in that area. Um, one interesting thing that occurred to me while I was preparing these few slides for my introductory statement is the fact that we can use or turn around <clears throat> that principle of offline verification and extend it a little so that all parties or all manufacturers who get their hands on the puff or on the microelectronic system throughout the supply chain would add their own individual signatures based on their own individual signing keys. So you can create a UNO-based signature chain that serves two purposes or that has two functionalities. First purpose is that you would have a continuous log, whoever has had access to the system throughout the supply chain. But then secondly, you can also create liability for those folks who have signed because the digital signatures, as we know, have that property of non-repudiation. So they also create liability. Um, and I think Luis has been talking about low energy roots of trust. I think these unique objects or these puffs could actually serve uh, as um, roots of trust and they have low energy consumption as well. Um, second aspect for future work, authenticity, of course, is not uh, equal to integrity. Um, I've already pointed out on one of the earlier slides that we can realistically only hope for partial solutions in this complex supply chain security problem. This is also just a partial solution to some extent, the use of buffs, because it provides authenticity, but it cannot yet provide, at least not in its raw form, uh, protection against adding hardware trojans or protection against adding malicious uh, additional functionalities that are hidden in the system. Uh, one interesting question is, can we somehow uplift or elevate that authenticity feature that PUFFs provide to also give us integrity and to also give us security in, in that aspect? I don't know, but it would be interesting to find out. And then as a last open question or item for future research, I think the trust model in a complex environment like the supply chain is, of course, 
horrendously complicated. Uh, working it out for path-based authentication, I think has never been done in full detail. And again, I think this would make an interesting subject of study for one or two, or perhaps even three or four or five papers. Good, that's it from my side. Thanks very much. Um, thanks for giving me the opportunity to speak and thanks for inviting me. Pleasure to be here. Thanks a lot, Uli. That was really insightful. So we'll move on to our next panelist, Dr. Matthew Arino. He's a, sen a senior principal engineer at Intel in the Systems Architecture and Engineering Group. Dr. Arino completed his bachelor's and master's degree at Utah State University in 2007 and took a position with Sandia National Labs. At Sandia, he focused on vulnerability assessment and reverse engineering of embedded systems, primarily utilizing ARM core processors. During this time, he also completed his PhD at the University of New Mexico with dissertation work on strengthening embedded system security through the use of puff enhanced cryptographic units. In 2013, Dr. Arena took a position with Raytheon Cybersecurity Innovations in Austin, Texas. He served as a chief architect for a number of anti-tamper solutions with specific expertise in establishing trust in POTS equipment. He currently serves as chief architect for a new high security product architecture at Intel. He's the author of numerous threat model documents and is well known within the industry for his subject matter expertise in supply chain and system level security. So over to you, Dr. Arino. All right, thank you, thank you again for having me. Um, so yeah, it, it's it's nice to hear some of the comments here uh, by folks um, talking about some of the capabilities and needs, the the desires for for some of these high security solutions for being able to work better in the supply chain, and proud to be able to to be a part of that and to be able to represent that at Intel. Um, so if you are looking for more information on that, if you're wanting to understand how we're how we're planning to work with that, some of the architecture's capabilities and things we're doing to support that. I am your person, so uh, please feel free to reach out. Um, with that, so my I have a very short slide deck here. Um, I really like the, the Q&A, so I try not to talk too much on my own, but did want to give you a little bit of overview of some of the things that we are working on. Um, so one of the... Uh, Things that I've really been pushing in my comments to, to people and, and the opportunities I've had to chat about supply chain risk, helping people understand how to how to do it, how to assess the risk that they have on supply chain things, um, and really gave them four four steps to doing this. Um, the first one, understanding what your life cycle is. Where does what you provide actually fit into the life cycle of the actual component? Are you uh, an Intel where you're creating a full component, are you a third party that's, comp that's creating a small portion of it? Are you an integrator that's taking completed components and creating systems? Identify what your life cycle is, know what the different stages are and things like that. The second, identify the risk and the threats that exist within each one of those phases. I'll show a little bit about that in, in my next slide. Um, we really have to be able to come to a common consensus as an industry and understand what all these threats are, um, how they impact us, how they can be uh, leveraged against us, what are the mitigations for them. Um, and I'm very grateful to be a part of work that is starting to move forward on that. I'll talk a little bit about that in the next slide as well. So really excited about the opportunity there. And determine, and from there, once you have your threats, what are your mitigations? Um, recognizing that some threats you can fully mitigate, some you can't, um, some take a substantial amount of effort, some don't, some require a significant amount of money, others don't. How do you formulate a plan? How do you figure out your your strategy for, for mitigating uh, the risk and, and attacks and threats that can happen against you? And importantly, how do you get the buy-in from your upper leadership at your organization that you work in? Um, putting together a strategy on that. And with that comes the last step, which is invest, invest, invest. You've got, we've got to be willing to do that. We've got to be able to recognize that fixing risk in our supply chain is not something that's just simply going to happen overnight. It's going to take years. Um, there are some risks that we will, that we could start addressing this year and be done by the end of the year. Some that we could start addressing this year, they're going to take five, maybe even 10 years. Um, to be able to dress, but we've got to be doing something on each one of these. So developing that investment strategy in your company, understanding what you're going to tackle each year, making that plan, updating it as new threats evolve, um, 
And then most importantly, be honest about your, your assessor. What are you, what are the real problems? What are your actual mitigations and are they really a full mitigation? Because many mitigations may partially uh, thwart an attack, but they don't do it fully. Being honest about that fact and being honest that there's still more work to do, even though you have potentially put forward a mitigation for, for these attacks, um, being honest in that and understanding what the real impact is, what the real cost, the return on investment, that's just very critical to these type of assessments. Um, to support this, so this is part of a paper that I uh, wrote here at Intel and uh, have a link there for it at the bottom. We actually have three papers now um, on this. This was meant to be kind of a 10,000 foot view um, of the supply chain and breaking it down into, from a manufacturer standpoint, from Intel standpoint, you know, what are the different phases of the supply chain? What are the different attacks that could happen during that? And again, 10,000 foot for you. So you zoom into each one of these, you're going to see a whole lot more attacks and, and opportunities, but hopefully it provides a good starting point. And in the paper, we talk about um, each one of these attacks, we describe what they are, give real world examples of each one. Um, we also have another paper where we really delve into the provisioning and the configuration. We talk about, you know, even more uh, specific attacks and threats and things like that. This type of information is critical for our industry to understand and, and come to a consensus and agreement on. Um, may not ever get to 100%, um, but hopefully if we can get to at least 90, 95% and then recognize that each of us can then take these, these threats back to our own companies, make our own assessment of how they affect our individual companies and then understand where we need to go from there. Um, and then finally, uh, helping people get involved with this. We need help from this. So one of the biggest issues um, that we face with this is that you know, we've talked about zero trust, we've talked about um, third party integration, we've talked about a lot of these threats. And the problem that we have in many places is that we don't have the tools yet. Um, we don't have the formalities, we don't have the specific information yet, we need to be able to do a quantitative assessment of the security of a supply chain. Um, we, we know some of these attacks and some of these threats, but again, it's like looking for a needle in the haystack, except we don't have a definition for the haystack. We don't have a definition for the needle. We don't know exactly where, what haystack to look for, look in for the needle. Uh, we just know that a needle exists and we're hoping we can find it. Um, we've got all of these tools generating all of this information throughout the entirety of the supply chain um, phases. And is there any standardization for it? Um, AI is this huge, you know, uh, big news thing. Everyone talks about chat GPT and security implications and everything else. But think of what AI could do for us from an assessment standpoint of our supply chain and analyzing that. It's simply too complex for a human to look at. It's too much hay and too little needles. Um, we need machine learning, we need models, we need AI, but to be able to do that, we've got to be able to standardize the information that we're generating from all of these tools. We've got to be able to create models that can consume that data, and we've got to be able to put together definitions of what our needles are that we're looking for. Um, being involved in these type of organizations and these type of efforts helps us to move that forward as we get these things defined, as we get policies, uh, procedures, practices, best uh, BKMs, those type of things uh, defined. We get the threat model identified. We can begin building those tools and then we can begin leveraging those tools in a way that supports a zero trust approach without compromising employee data or sensitive information about employees and stuff like that. Because again, let's face it, uh, zero trust is a lot easier to do in an environment where people recognize the importance of security, where they are willing to sacrifice uh, their personal information or other things for the sake of security. The, the private sector it doesn't necessarily work that same way. So we're trying to find a balance here to keep that, that uh, employee information safe, but still be able to implement zero trust type of capabilities within the supply chain. Um, so working on these efforts, being engaged in these different things, we're asking for people's help to see if we can find that middle ground between what 
you know governments want, what the industry wants, what consumers want, find a way to come together to, to gather this information, create the tools and everything to do the assessment and do it in a way that's gonna strengthen the supply chain for everyone. And with that, I will stop talking. Thank you, uh, Dr. Matthew Arino. Uh, our last panelist is uh, Mr. Severio Bazari from Booz Allen. Uh, Severio is a microelectronics fellow. He leads Booz Allen's microelectronics practice, a team of more than 100 engineering and science uh, professionals working across the domains of microelectronics hardware, assurance, security, prototyping, design, and test. Severo is nationally recognized leader in the field of microelectronics with over 30 years of expertise across the microelectronics research, development, manufacturing, and policy domains. His distinguished career includes technical and, and industry engagement at the highest levels across strategic programs on behalf of the Department of Defense, including his current work in support of the Office of the Secretary of Defense for Research and Engineering, Trusted and Assured Microelectronics Program, Defense Advanced Research Projects, Agency Microsystems Technology Office, the Air Force Research Laboratory, uh, Laboratory Trusted Microelectronics Division, the National Security Agency, the Naval Surface Warfare Center, Crane Division, and more. Mr. Fazari has had a direct role in driving the U.S. federal government's largest investments to date in microelectronics, including senior advisory and technical execution roles in support of such strategic efforts as the DARPA Electronics Resurgence Initiative. Mr. Fazari holds a BS in electrical engineering from the Johns Hopkins University and an AMS in electrical engineering from the University of Pittsburgh. And with that, uh, Severio, you can provide your positional statement. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to the organizers. Um, first off, as per Dr. Patel, my slides do not get approved, so I'd like to provide some comments. The first comment being, um, what I'm going to say represents my position in no way represents the position of my company as such from there. So with that out of the way, I'm the person before the fun part of the discussion. So what I'd like to comment is a couple of things. And again, with uh, colleagues on the panel, I really appreciate some comments have been made, but some things over the last two or three years that I'd like to sort of talk about, which is number one, I think people are beginning to understand the evolution of the supply chain. You know, one of the biggest changes that occurred during the pandemic was availability of technology went from two weeks to 52 weeks and nobody knew why. So the big challenge right now is what used to be a cost-driven just-in-time supply chain has fundamentally changed. There's a bifurcation of the supply chain driven by political, by um, weather, by other aspects from there. So the nature of the availability of technology is changing over time, which is providing an opportunity and a requirement for us to better understand what that supply chain looks like. For example, you know, within a supply chain, how deep do organizations go relative to their subcontractors? Does it be that, you know, I have five suppliers for a piece of technology. What I don't know is those five suppliers are purchasing a single resistor from one supplier. If that one supplier goes out of business then everything starts collapsing down around us. So first off, do we understand what's involved? The second part, which is kind of the area that I've always involved is how do we measure the supply chain and whatever we're going to do to enhance and protect it as such. What I mean by measurement is not what are interesting metrics that allow me to demonstrate a capability, but how do we determine a value that is accepted by the creator and the consumer of the technology? I, what are the accepted measurements relative to supply chain protection? What's the factor? What's the number to go down that path to go from there? Um, one of the things that becomes important is then how do I manage the risk associated with that aspect from there? Meaning, how do I want to measure that risk? And then how do I want to measure it as such? One of the challenges, you know, and I've had the privilege of working both commercial and DOD, and my colleagues have mentioned the DOD life cycle. The reality is DOD cannot get what it wants. So it needs to change. It needs to be agile. So this means a fundamental rethinking of the process that was commented on earlier was for the supply chain is we're going to need to use technologies um, that we don't have access to in the future. What do we do? 
So there are opportunities for the community to rethink about that. One of the challenges now, and with my colleague who brought up earlier, the various um, organizations that are talking about standards organizations, you know, which is the standard organization that is relevant or not relevant as the case may be. Everybody's pushing for ideas, but it isn't the entire community that comes together. But with that being said, I think there's an opportunity to do two things is the partnership. The good news is people recognize a problem and they're willing to partner. So as technology gets developed, my challenge to the community is how do we create technology that's relative to the actual supply chain? I think everybody recognizes there are risks, but if technology comes into play, how do we bring it into the supply chain, make it usable and measurable to the point that people can make decisions about using it? You know, in my privilege in working on DARPA projects, you know, you hear about the valley of death. People build innovative ideas, but nobody's able to use them. So you're caught with this interesting paradigm. I've measured success, but the reality is no program, no commercial effort is willing to take that technology forward. You know, DARPA has been working on hardware security for 15 years. You know, puffs were developed in 2001. Over the last six to seven years, companies are starting to use puffs, you know, in commercial mainstream projects. So, you know, DARPA was doing research in that space back in the late 2000s as such to see about the viability. There's still some argument about what makes sense in that space as such. But notionally, there's no clear path to bring technology forward in an acceptable manner. There's standards committees being formed. It takes time to bring all that stuff forward. And the challenge is there's risk associated with utilization and how do you manage that risk and make it acceptable. So I think there's a great opportunity now with a big push in microelectronics, but a, what I would encourage is that people think about how do you collaborate and rethink the way that you approach the problems. And with that, I'll turn it back to the organizers. And again, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Severio. Uh, so and with that, uh, we kick off the Q&A uh, part of uh, today's panel, uh, the, the fun part. Um, just want to remind the audience that there is a Q&A uh, option at the uh, at the bottom of your uh, uh, screen. You should be able to click on that to input your questions. So please do so. Uh, in the meantime, we can kick off the Q&A. Uh, do you want to start the first one? Yes. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Yanis. So my first question, and uh, with you, it's open to all the panelists. You can give your opinion on this is logic locking. We know that logic locking has been used as one of the premier solutions for supply chain security over the past decade, right? Both in academia, industry, and governments. Uh, so what is your opinion on the future of logic locking? What do you think about uh, how logic locking is going to go ahead over the next decade? I see Saverio's hand raised, so maybe I'll ask Saverio to pitch in his opinion first, and then um, the other panelists can go in any order they want. So. It is a contentious subject because a number of, again, the subject matter experts have opinions about whether it's viable or not. Mm -hmm. Challenge with the technique goes back to a comment that was made earlier. Is there a silver bullet and what can you use it or not use it for as such from there? Does logic locking potentially have a place in a security solution? Yes, but the challenge is on the user to define how do I use it? And more importantly, where do I not use it? The, mm. you know, my experience has been people promote security solutions. They lead with the, oh, there's a problem. This technology will solve it. And I would push back and say, no, it could be part of a solution. You need to determine where could it go as such. I could argue that logic locking is fundamentally broken and there are issues with that. But I think overall, the issue is understanding that any sort of protection technique needs to be part of a strategy. It can't just be a solution that I would be uncomfortable saying that logic locking by itself will be solved. Because if you look at the history that over time, it's been progressively broken, fixed, broken, fixed as such, as with many other security techniques. Thanks, Avelio, for your comments. Uh, anyone else on the panelists want to pitch in? I'll probably randomly choose maybe Uli, if you want. 
Yeah, so um, I think I agree with uh, what Saviru just said. Um, I think one question is, will this back and forth that we observe in that area eventually lead to a secure primitive or not? <laughs> I mean, uh, we can give leeway to the developers actually in the sense that we can say it's natural insecurity, that primitives are broken and then fixed and then broken and then fixed again. The question is, will it eventually lead to something that is accepted and secure or not? For example, in the case of block ciphers, right? You could argue that we have a 2000 years of evolution from Caesar cipher to AES. And I guess everyone in this meeting would believe that AES is secure and that there are no longer any attack surfaces in AES. And the question is, can something similar happen in logic locking or can something similar happen also in puffs? I mean, puffs also have been subject to that cycle that they've been attacked and improved and then attacked and improved and intact uh, and improved continuously. Um, so that's one thing. Can we ever expect that logic locking will become secure? But then I think I would also agree with Saverio. We have to model that complex ecosystem of the supply chain a bit better in the sense that we can sharply define what the sub problems are. And I think we are not there yet, right? We are quite remote from that point. But this point seems to be a necessary prerequisite to applying any of these partial solutions that we have uh, in order to fix a certain problem. And I think this is one of the major issues that we have in the next year uh, and, and decades to come um, that we really define the problems sharply that we have in the supply chain. I think that's my comment. Okay, thanks, Uli. How about you, uh, Lucy? Uh, yeah, so I, I, I think, again, I'm going to agree with these colleagues. I think, you know, there's been a lot of objection to logic locking and due to the fact that we just said, you know, it has failed in, circum in certain circumstances. Um, but just like anything else, it doesn't mean there won't be a solution that will eventually work. Um, the question is, you know, will people be able to keep working on it to make it stronger and strengthen it? And as part of the heterogeneous solution, you know, that might be the way to think about it. And uh, I do agree with that piece as well. Okay, thanks. I'll move on to Vipul. Yeah, thank you. Um, so my, my perspective on logic locking is it's... Uh, it is very much a hit or miss type of thing, agreeing with most of the panelists in terms of the techniques that are developed and then there are, as a defense and then there are attacks that are um, on those. So you, know, you look at everything from logic locking at the very low levels of gate insertion, the idea of function locking. So not just the gates itself, but actual capabilities on that chip. There's time-based locking, for example, uh, people have started using EFPGAs to, as a redaction technique that Dr. Sengupta mentioned earlier. So, you know, there are ways to either obfuscate, remove um, those types of critical pieces of information, but we are seeing those attacks occur. So to my earlier point about improvements and quick fixes, we are seeing that a lot of microelectronics hardware in the past has been like, this is the hardware and we'll do software fixes over it. Um, the idea is to protect intellectual property right now has been very much done through the legal aspect. And we are seeing people working on ways to protect uh, through research and development, actual applications within the chip to protect the IP on that chip. However, you know, looking at this from a larger scale is like, once these systems are, or these chips are operating by itself, right? We have protected it per se, and we start integrating. We're starting to see these layers and opportunities for engagement into the chip that we didn't plan on early on, right? And so I think having studies done in this area is fine. Um, as far as it being the go-to solution, I don't think that's there. I don't know if it'll ever be there. And saying those types of statements when you're recorded, really, I'm gonna hopefully see this in 20 years if someone proves me wrong. But uh, getting to the point of, you know, we need this as a portion, uh, as part of our toolkit to get to more secure uh, silicon, for example. Over. Thanks, people. So how about Matthew? I, I think everything that, that needs to be said has been said, said so far. Um, I would I would agree with, with what's been said. I would also say I would caution anyone against a, uh, the notion of a one-size-fits-all solution, a, a be-all, end-all. There is no such thing. 
I'm just going to say that flat out. Um, in this world, everything is, it's just about staying ahead of the attacker. That's all. This is a cat and mouse game. At the end of the day, it always will be. If you think you have a solution that cannot be broken, then you don't belong in security. I'm just going to say it flat out. Um, you're, if your goal is to create something that can't be broken, then you're going to spend your life in misery. Um, we have to recognize there are benefits to this. I think there are potential benefits of this type of technology. I think it can provide us leeway. It can provide us additional runway. It can push back the attacker in, in some cases, in some instances, in others, not as much. Um, that really should be what the what the evaluation is. It should never be a question of, is this the be all end all solution that's gonna fix everything? Um, so do the assessment, understand its pros, understand its cons, figure out just how well it's going to protect the solution that you have and where it's good uh, for, but be open again, be honest about your assessment of, of what it's good for and what it's not. Thank you, Matthew. So um, Yanis, do you want to take the next question? Yes, so there was a question that was uh, from the audience uh, from Kevin uh, Quit. Um, uh, for those that are submitting uh, questions, could you also put your affiliation uh, moving forward. So the question is, in leave behind applications where the chipper system can be captured and totally reverse engineered, how much does this impact the supply chain for future releases of that chipper system? Who wants to take that question? I, I guess I could talk, I, I went last on the on the prior question. I guess I can go first on, on this one. Uh, um, obviously it, it, it provides some, uh, some impact, of course. Um, but there, I don't think there's a way to definitively state that as a definitive of what that impact is. Um, simply, you know, even today, so for instance, in the, in the uh, standards world, I don't know how many of y'all are aware of um, this particular effort, but inside of the open compute platform, there's a push for a standard um, implementation known as Calyptra. It's pegged as an open source implementation of uh, a RISC-V processor for security purposes, uh, being the first root of measurement, root of trust of measurement that would execute on the platform. It's open architecture. It's free. You just get access to it. This isn't even the case of an attacker hacks your supply chain and gains the RTL and everything else. What is the risk for that? Well, obviously, a large percentage of the industry feel that open source access to the RTL does not in and of itself present an inherent issue. Um, but looking at uh, looking at Linux as an open source software, so we're very familiar with this open source software concept. The open source hardware is a little bit different. Um, but uh, even on the open source software, it's not like Linux has been bug free for the last several decades. It, it just doesn't happen. Just because something's open source doesn't mean it's without vulnerabilities and issues. So yeah, coming back to the hardware, um, does that make it a, a bigger risk? Um, I would say that it doesn't change the factor of whether or not there's going to be bugs in it. Hopefully you reduce the number of bugs. Again, that's the hope behind open source software is that you reduce the number of bugs and arguments can be made one way or the other on that. I think the bigger question is when you open source that hardware, um, where do you lock in? Where do you say this is good enough and I'm going to manufacture this? Because, you know, it's easy to do this on easier, sorry, easier to do this on the software side. Because if I do find something wrong later on, I can just issue a patch and fix it and go about my merry way. RTL, you can't really do that. Um, it takes a while to be able to fix that. Um, so yes, there are struggles and there are questions on just how big of a risk that is. Um, I know this doesn't answer the question definitively. And again, I'm gonna say, I don't think there is an answer. It really depends. Uh, maybe some of the design you want to open source because you have assessed it and you determine hey, this isn't a risk, and if an attacker got that, hey, it would be fine. What if they got access to your crypto engine? What if they got access to your security engines? What if they got access to anything security critical related? Um, maybe, 
And, you know, how does that affect other technologies and mitigations that you have? It, it's an open question. I'm sorry. I know it's probably not going to be a satisfactory answer for, for the questionnaire, um, but I, I wish I could <laughs> give you something better, but that's really about it. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew. Any other comments from any of the other panelists? Yep, go ahead, Samir. So I, again, I would say just it depends because for products going forward, you will have a security plan, security architecture, both on the commercial and defense side. And part of that plan will be, you know, <clears throat> when I build the hardware, what are the expectations? The only comment I'd make ultimately the data is what you need to protect. That's what matters. And so your hardware strategy will be predicated on what you view relative to the data operating on that hardware. You may not care. And so um, I think what's happening now is how do you do that security planning? And I would argue in the last four to five years, commercial companies are starting to realize the criticality of what to do in that space is evidenced by what's going both internally and externally in the standards bodies. Over. Yeah, I was always here. I would just add to that. I think I absolutely agree that the whole purpose of secure hardware is to protect the data. And uh, that's the whole purpose, right? Whatever is being um, done in there. So I think that if you are, um, if your first engineering is going to jeopardize that, then, you know, that is a, a, um, a consideration. I think that it's, it's kind of, um, to me, when you say, how does that affect the supply chain? It really depends what that is, right? What is the supply chain around that particular part or electronics, or is this a general question? Um, I think the answer to that would, it, it, it would be depends. Thank you, Luis. Any other comments before we move to the next question? not let's look there's another question um from a uh, from a participant uh giovanni uh ong uh from texas a m how do we mathematically formulate security problems in the supply chain for the semiconductor industry i know this is a, a big problem so <laughs> metrics i guess would be one consideration right so yeah uh, i think we kind of yeah, sure, Louise, I can start here. I think that we kind of covered that to the complexity aspect of things. I mean, the supply chain itself and, and the security thereof just in general is extremely complex. And specifically, you know, for DOD uh, in general, but I think formulating, uh, first of all, we have to understand what that security is in the supply chain we can, before we can mathematically formulate um, a plan, right, or a mitigation strategy um for that so i think first of all you know there's some good suggestions about you know can we use ai can we use mathematics can we use toolkits to do that i think these are all really good ideas um but i think that has to we have to start there let me offer an inverse to that so i would challenge the community is how can you formalize security protections prove that you're secure or can you? I think the question for that too, honestly, Severio, as Luis here is speaking, um, is scalability, right? I think yep. that that has always been the question with formal methodologies for security verification is, is how do we scale? And that is something that I think a lot of people have been spending a lot, a lot of time on. I, I, the reason I always bring it up is I think that's certainly a challenge that people would love to get some ideas in that space because creating a problem modeling in that you run into issues but if there's any sort of formality that you can apply to the integrity of your supply chain you got possibilities so this is uh people with the air force research laboratory so um i i'll say this in kind of a, a joking manner that being able to predict the supply chain mathematically is like being able to predict the stock market. So there are all sorts of influences that occur in the supply chain, right? It is sometimes driven by emotion, geopolitical situations, the weather. Um, so, you know, having the ability to come up with a closed form or weigh 
to really identify where those security problems can occur, I think is gonna be a very ambitious job. And if someone can solve it, that would be great. Now, to, to a way of kind of modeling something like that, right, is this concept of system dynamics, right, which is an approach to understand like how, how to model nonlinear behavior of complex systems um, based off of previous year's data, um, you know, time delays, the way that things flow across that. So there may be some higher level tools that can get us into a ballpark, but not necessarily something mathematically specific. Over. Yeah, I mean, can I quickly add, perhaps? So first of all, I wanted to congratulate uh, Giovanni Ong. I hope I pronounced that correctly for the question, because I think it's a very interesting question. I'm a mathematician myself, so I always like to think about mathematical formalization, of course. Um, I think we need to differentiate between um, formalizing the entire supply chain and all its possible security threats and formalizing one particular sub problem from the supply chain, right? And I think Giovanni was more or less referring to both. I think he was also addressing with his question whether there would be single sub problems in the supply chain that we could formulate uh, mathematically. And I th think here the answer would clearly be yes, right? If you take a certain well defined sub problem, then you could use the standard tools that people have in theoretical cryptography and start working on this. But I think all of us have already stated, and let me just state it again, a comprehensive formalization of the entire supply chain is entirely out of reach at the moment and, and probably forever. Um, but that doesn't matter. I think still you can start formalizing uh, certain sub problems. Uh, you only need to be aware of the sort of limits of your formalization. Every formalization defines a certain space well, but it also leaves out certain problems in the margin or beyond your definition. So it also has weaknesses from the start uh, being built in into the formalization. And one has to be aware of that fact. I think that's important. Over. <laughs> Thank you. There's, there's actually a, a follow-up, uh, multiple follow-ups from, from Giovanni. Um, so it's um, just as the, the semiconductor industry moved from rules-based design for manufacturing, so DFM, to model-based DFM, can you suggest how we can model this mathematically? For example, system identification to create model-based security systems. Or, or and then I'll, I'll combine the next one. Or can we use portfolio optimization to combine unifying a broad set of security problems or portfolio mathematical models for individual security problems. So if I could, my comment would be to focus on a smaller subset and perhaps model something that makes sense. The, the challenge of the linkage between the design for manufacturing and security is that the laws of physics apply to manufacturing, the security domain, the threat space and the dynamics there are much different. However, there's some aspects, you know, associated to bad design that you might be able to model the insider threat and the aspects associated towards the guy who shows up and decides one day to steal something. I don't know how you're going to model that. So parts of this portfolio, you can certainly model as such um, to go from there as it relates to particular aspects. I would, it's an interesting area and people have looked at it. The challenge is people tend to hype it up too much question is is to bite off a piece and demonstrate a, a small success to show the value of going down the path traditionally with hardware with the security and protection people tend to describe the problem at a higher level and then equate a lower level solution to solving the entire problem which leads into the issue over yeah i think i i would just add on to this i i know that there are efforts right now underway for uh quantifiable assurance and attempt, attempting to tackle this very problem. How do you, how do you quantify security within the, within the supply chain? Um, and how do you look at that? And, you know, I talked earlier about um, using artificial intelligence, machine learning to be able to do that, identifying the hay, identifying the needle and things like that. One of the other aspects with this and one of the challenges to look at is there is no one model to rule them all on here. Um, what U.S. government might flag uh, or might see as a red flag is not necessarily what 
um, European government would see as a red flag versus Asian governments would see as a red flag, um, what commercial world would see as a red flag. Um, there, it's a very challenging thing to come up with that single model um, of being able to do it and that single way of being able to quantify the security of the supply chain. I think what you're going to have instead is you're going to have different sets of standards, um, whether you're commercial, whether you're private, whether you're government, whatever it may be, um, that you're going to apply to that. So the important thing is trying to get the, and from my perspective, is trying to get the data together, um, whether we do you know, a, a rules based, whether you do a modeling based, whatever, um, it's all reliant upon the data that we can bring into this and what we're actually capturing and what, uh, where the source of that data is coming from. Um, then, you know, you can apply whatever methodology you want to to that data, um, as long as we can clearly articulate what that data is that we need and what it should contain. Then once we have those models put together, we have the data, we can have the arguments in about which one better articulates or better quantifies um, the actual security of our supply chains. Um, I think it's kind of an open question at this point in time. And I don't know that I could, that we can really give an answer to that until we actually know what all data we can get and how we can process it and look at it. So um I'm excited to see some of the research that's being done on here, some of the theories that are being put forward um, for what's, what they're going to be able to do, but I think it's just incomplete at this point. Um, and I, again, I don't know that we'll ever as an entire industry fully agree on what is the best, um, but we have, we'll have the options and we can decide for ourselves which one we feel uh, portrays that information the best. Great, uh, thank you. Kanad, you want to take the last question? Yes, I would ask the last question and then we will hand it over to Dr. Gangku for the concluding the session. Uh, from the vulnerability and security risk that we described in the abstract, including hardware trojans insertion, IC counterfeiting, overproduction and reverse engineering, which one do you think is the most critical and which one is the least explored in existing research? And you can give your opinion as you feel about these topics. Who wants to go first? I'll, I'll go first. Yes, I, and I'm sorry to sound like a broken record. Uh, I will argue it's simply metrics. It doesn't matter what the research area is, but you need to come up with a way that how you choose to measure progress in this technology is acceptable by the community. Um, traditionally, you know, research has been going on for 15 years in this space. The challenge is everybody has their own metric to demonstrate progress. You need to be able to demonstrate to Northrop why this technology makes sense for their program portfolio as such. And I think as a community, we haven't done a good job of agreeing that, hey, if you make an advancement here and demonstrate it this way, then yes, it's technology we should consider continuing to invest in. The metrics to define what security means are difficult because ultimately, there is no cost associated with security. Everybody agrees that we need security. Nobody knows what it's worth or what it costs. And so going forward, depending on the area you want to research in, how do you associate, how do you create or develop metrics that say why this has value and what's the inherent value of security? Over. Yeah, I'll, so I'll follow up on that as well. Um, this is, a, it's a challenge. And again, a uh, recurring theme here, it depends. Um, obviously, I think, you know, I, I'm a student of Dr. Jim Pasqualek at UNM. Um, it's where I did my PhD. Um, I loved hardware Trojans. I loved the work that we did with hardware Trojans. It was fun, but that was a malicious attacker, <laughs> attacker in me. Um, and yeah, something like that, you know, from the ability to mitigate you know, obviously that's a colossal impact. Um, now, you all, but you also don't see them. I remember being at an at an NSF uh, conference once, and we were talking about it. And the you know professors were talking about the struggle that they were having getting funding to even do research on hardware trojans because you know government officials were just like, "Well, show me one," and they're like, "Well, I don't know." 
uh, you know, there's not a whole lot of real world examples of them. Most of them are theoretical um, done in labs by researchers. Now, that doesn't mean that they're not valid. It doesn't mean that they're not even, it doesn't even mean that they're not out there. It just, when you have something like that, the consequence of, of activating the Trojan is so severe and so catastrophic, not only to who you would activate it against, but the fact that once you activate it, it's, it's like a one-time fuse, it's blown. You know, there, there's no going back. Um, we're just going to ignore fib attacks to, <laughs> to, re, redo a, to redo a fuse. But it's that concept where once you blow it, you know, people are going to know it and they're going to fix it. But it takes so, so long. And what's the impact? Well, it depends on how, you know, how many of those devices are affected type of thing. So obviously there's a huge potential with with those type of attacks. And then you see other the other side with the supply chain attacks, like the the um, so the attacks against our supply chain, against signing, firmware updates, um, things like that that have happened. How difficult is it for attackers to get into your key management um, capabilities and manipulate things there? We've seen several recent attacks on that. Um, so obviously, you know, easier, still not easy, but easier um, attacks from that standpoint could still have catastrophic um, impact. So it's, it really does depend from one um, from one person to another. And that's why you know, I counseled in my earlier slides, you really have to do your own analysis. You have to understand where you fit in the supply chain. You have to understand your own attacks and what those attacks are against you. And we can't keep looking at this as something that's static across the entire industry and say that, that because this is high priority for me, it's high priority for everyone. That's simply not the way security works. There's very little that is static about security. Um, so from that perspective, just encourage everyone to make their own assessments of that and recognize that their assessments are specific to them. Um, please share to help other people in creating their own, but please recognize that your assessments are yours. Thank you, Matthew. So since we have just a couple of minutes remaining for the panel, so I would uh, ask Professor Gangku from the University of Maryland and National Science Foundation to conclude the panel. But before that, I would like to thank all my fellow panelists, as well as my fellow moderator, Yanis, as well as Farouk and Yair and Gang for organizing this session. It, was, it has been a great pleasure for all of us to learn a lot on supply chain security and get your own opinions on these subjects. So over to you, Dr. Gangku. Thank you very much, uh, Kanard, and thanks all the panelists for this wonderful panel. And uh, my name is Gang Q, and I'm a professor at the University of Maryland College Park. And think a lot of people on the Zoom, they know me. And I've been doing hardware security for pretty much my career. And currently, I'm at the National Science Foundation in charge of the hardware security portfolio in their uh, secure and the cyber uh, and the trustworthy cyberspace program called the SATC, SATC. And as I think, I mean, I'm going to repeat what Sever just mentioned. So whatever I'm going to say here just uh, does not reflect anything about the NSF. It is just uh, me as a professor from University of Maryland and also as the founding director and the co-founder of this uh, Hardware Secure and Trust the Technical Committee. And uh, but back to this panel. So it is called, I mean, what can save us in the microelectronic supply chain security. So. I pretty much agree with all the panelists. I don't think there's no single technology can save us, but without efforts or events like this, like this kind of virtual panel, we will not be saved. Nobody's going to save us. So we need a collective effort from the community to save us, to save the uh, supply chain uh, for, uh, security. And with that, I think, I mean, I'm really happy, I mean, to see this discussion here with all the different views of the panelists and also the open questions. People ask about a lot of very nice questions about logical obfuscation, about this, I mean, open source, about model-based model, model -based design for security. So they are very, very interesting questions. And then it is fine for people to keep, I mean, disagreements with that is part of the research and also is part of the, I mean, the, the challenge we're facing. And with that, I'm going to thank all the audience from all over the world. I know, I mean, some of you probably are already very late in the night. And thank you very much for supporting this event. And also, I want to thank the 
the, the panelists, Matthew Stavario, Vipo, Uli, and Luis. And thank you very much for taking time from your busy schedule to help the community on this very important issue. And many thanks to Yanis and Kennard for organizing the panel. And also, I mean, Amanda from CEDA to help us for more than probably almost two years for this, I mean, the, the CAD for assurance uh, demos and the panels and the talks. And finally, I want to I mean, thank my uh, colleagues, uh, 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 Srup and uh, Yir and Zhong Yi, who has been the people behind this whole thing to make this happen. And with that, I think we can conclude today's panel. And uh, depends on where you are, have a nice day, have a nice evening, or have a great weekend. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye.